Okay, hello. Um, a warm welcome to everybody to our last lecture of this cycle of the Planetary Health Academy. Um, it's not the last event but because we still have a workshop coming up, but um, this is our last lecture in this cycle. So I'm very much looking forward to this colorful lecture packed full of creative and committed projects of you, our participants, basically. Um, as you know, our slogan is from knowledge to transformative action. And so here we are now after the last um, nearly three months in which we learned together, uh, together a lot of different things. And today's focus is now on entirely on the transformational aspects. Um, so we want to learn from people within our network and from their inspiring projects. Yeah, and some of you might wonder what will be after this lecture series, what will come after the third series of Planetary Health Academy. And we can announce so far that things will change a little bit and we will focus more on clinical aspects and also more on labs on, of transformation so that you can get even more into action or reevaluate maybe even some of your projects. Martin will talk about this um, later, but because actually, or also sadly, kind of the current situation in Germany, probably some of you have heard it about the massive precipitations which caused extreme floodings and also um, sadly, a few or like more over a hundred deaths show like again, how urgent the situation is and how urgently we really need to do something and that it's not enough to just learn about it, but that, yeah, as I already said, action is even, even more important. And so we're really, really happy to have these wonderful people today on our panel who are showing how they are already demonstrating their willpower and their ambition and whatever, and how humans can do something good and do all the good to the planet or no, there's a cool slogan that I wanted to re recreate. Wait a second. So it's called, you can't do all the good the planet needs, but you can do all the good you can do. So they're showing how they're doing it in their way. And the first person is Sophia. She's from the youth council of the foundation generations or Jugendrat der Stiftung Generation in German, which is not directly translated because I'm not sure if that's the true English um, translation. And they're making demonstrations on every day that is, has a temperature over 30 degrees to, yeah, to show why climate action or climate yeah action is so important. So yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I don't need to tell you that climate change is here and I don't need to tell you that we or that the politics need to act. Um, we all know it. And in the beginning of this year, we sat down together and decided that we would um, not let another record summer happening with a lot of heat. And um, yeah, we needed action and that is why since the beginning of June, we have been sounding the alarm on every day above 28 of degrees uh, in every action against um, climate politics, in every um, headline about the climate and on every day where we felt the heat or where we in the last few or in the last week felt the climate change in ways of flooding. Um, yeah. The implementation is relatively simple, so we just um, we don't know what we can do anymore because everything is done. Every um, demand is um, out there, and the politics heard it. Maybe they didn't felt it, but they heard it. And I'm sorry about the background noise. Um, that is why we said we sirens to stop or sirens to take a look on things that are happening right now so we announced a demo a demonstration in small circles and implemented it and we're trying to be loud so so far the experience is that it is accepted because um, the sirens against heat is something we all, or heat is something we all feed, uh, feel, and the floodings is 
um, the floodings are something we all see. So it's something everybody um, has in the everyday life. And we feel a lot of participation um, to react on things that are, um, yeah, that we can feel and see. So, um, but also there are um, a little bit difficulties um, to bring it on uh, to, to many people on a huge platform. And so now we're trying to improve our um, sirens against the heat. And this is why I wanna show you a picture. We're trying to be present on the internet and not just try to be in front of, um, yeah, the politics um, and be present with a few people. We're trying to be online on social media as well. And now this Wednesday, um, uh, this Thursday, I'm sorry, we already have Wednesday, and we're gonna start um, on Twitter and on Instagram to um, create a social media online alarm um, where we could implement the heat we feel and the, yeah, all the things we see so we can react on it properly in our ways. Um, and I'm hoping it's working. We have this little videos. It could be loud right now. Where we um, present our sirens and trying to react on news, on um, information we get to climb politics. Um, so <laughs> this is our um, heat alarm or our sirens of, uh, against the heat right now. And if you have any question, you're more than welcome to ask them right now. Um, I'm gonna send you some links into um, the chat here to give you um, information where you can find our sirens of heat and we would be very happy if you support us so maybe um, start yeah and campaign some action by your own because uh, you got all the power in you and even small steps um, create some attention and some awareness and yeah we hope <laughs> to be part of it <laughs> with you thank you very much sophia i just checked the weather forecast and it said that if you don't have any plans for saturday and sunday so far it will get uh, 28 degrees so get prepared to do your own heat demonstration yes, uh, exactly. either where you are at your home or like on twitter as well. And also, Sophia said it, in case you have any questions, please um, post them immediately at the best because we want to um, ask the questions and share the questions directly after everybody spoke. So thank you very much, Sophia, so far. Then we will go on to Linda and you will share the links. So much. In the chat. And you're doing an activism journey you could say from Munich to Venice. So we're looking forward. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can see it now. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, my name is Linda. I'm a biostatistician by training um, and planetary health enthusiast. And I'm also part of Impact Revolution, which is a um, Munich, uh, which, is, which is a pan-European NGO uh, founded in Munich. Um, and we are currently um, curating our latest campaign, which is called Plastic Mountains, an activist journey through the Alps. You can already imagine what that is about, but um, yeah. So, so let's stay for a moment with plastic. 
probably most of you, when you hear the word plastic, you think of um, maybe the uh, plastic bag that you just took off from your uh, from the delivery from yesterday, um, or you think about the straws that um, we've seen so many times in um, in the oceans or in the nose of some turtles. Uh, we know that plastic is is associated with the biodiversity loss, and maybe we also know that it is associated with the climate crisis. But when we think about it for a moment longer, um, plastic is also impacting our health, not as much about microplastic, because we don't know enough about it, but via endocrine disruptors. Um, with the moment that we ship um, our plastic crash um, towards um, Southeast Asia, for example, um, we enhance social inequalities um, and of course, plastic is also at the basis of our linear economy. So um, the moment that we think about the plastic crisis, as we, as we like to think of it, we see that it is actually a multidimensional problem that needs systemic solutions. Um, systemic solutions such as um, legislation, um, such as technological and technical innovations. Solutions like um, education about the plastic crisis and action from all sides of society. So we imagine this, all these uh, plastic mountains that we have created um, throughout the years, um, and we want to, to solve them. Uh, we want to, to move them, actually. So instead of moving them, we decided to move ourselves. And we are, we are currently crossing the Alps, um, started in Munich last week, um, and we just left Innsbruck yesterday, I think. Um, then we're headed to Pfundas at the moment. Then we will be going to Allegge, Belluno, and then finally end up in Venice um, in mid of August. And why we want to do this? Because we want to talk about the uh, multiple dimensions of the plastic crisis. And we also want to talk about the systemic solutions that are being proposed and implemented all over the world, all over the world. So um, we will have, or we are already having um, both online and offline events to educate about the plastic crisis and to inspire to action. Um, we just had yesterday our first film screening in Innsbruck and tomorrow we will have our first panel discussion about plastic and health. And throughout the campaign, we are shooting a short movie to document the campaign and also to interview some of these change makers that are uh, working in, for example, in legislation um, or in um, industry wide changes. But most of all, uh, the thing that pops to, to the eye is that we will carry the weight of the plastic crisis on our shoulders by carrying um, costumes on our rucksacks uh, made out of plastic waste. Um, why we want to do that, uh, we already had a few campaigns in the past um, about combining trash and art. Um, and what we saw was that art, especially in places where it wasn't expected, uh, where, was, where it surprised people, it creates curiosity. So it started the conversation um, when Clara, our founder, um, crossed uh, Europe with uh, with this uh, flamingo made out of plastic trash in 2018. Um, she was stopped at every uh, corner, at every traffic light and people, children to elderly people asked her about, about it and this sparked the conversation. Um, yeah, so in a summary, um, this is what our NGO um, wants to do. We are a climate and environmental movement. Um, dedicated to building a better tomorrow through creative means. So by use of art and creativity, participatory action and citizen engagement. We think that everyone is a change maker and that everyone can take part um, in, in, their, in the impact revolution. If you're interested, um, we are more than happy to, to get in touch. You can um, follow our campaign uh, on the website or in the social media, I forgot to put them here, but I will put the links in the chat and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Winder. There's actually one, which is kind of funny, but it's really important actually as well. How did she manage to get through Europe with people stopping her at every corner? <laughs> <laughs> I think it lasted some, it was like a couple of months, was 2000 kilometers. 
Um, yeah, and there was also event uh, throughout the way cleanups, but also interaction with with um, actors of circular economy uh, with um, with the TU Delft. I know that they did a lot of events. Um, so yeah, just uh, hearing from every side of society what everyone can contribute to. It probably also shows that you need to calculate your time not to like how do you say not. Too, too less, narrow, not yeah. Less, uh, too narrow, yeah. Yeah, some Thank people you. told us that actually you can do the hike in 30 days, the ones that we're doing now, but we're doing that in um, 40 days. So, yeah, <laughs> we'll have enough time to talk with people. Is that the purpose as well? I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll hear from Lena Noack and Lotte Noack, um, who will present their campaign raising awareness about the health implications of climate change in view of the upcoming federal elections in Germany in September. Um, they're organizing a whole week of activism. Um, so what exactly are you planning? Yeah, I'm going to start. Um... Yes, we are Lotta and Lena, and we are studying medicine in our 10th uh, semester. And we are from the Health for Future local group in uh, Düsseldorf and part of the organization team of the project Health Needs Climate Protection, who will save 150,000 lives, which takes place this uh, September. And um, this action week is part of the election campaign of Health for Future alongside parliamentary talks and the uh, position paper of Health for Future. And that the Lancet study, the public health implications of the Paris Agreement, a modeling study, which was published in uh, 2021. Um, shows that at least 150,000 premature deaths in Germany can be prevented through decisive political action to comply with the Paris Climate Agreement. And in our week of action in September, people in uh, health professions clarify in a targeted manner about the relevance of the climate crisis and the resulting dangers for our health and about the opportunities offered by resolute climate policy. Um, we urge politicians and all candidates for chancellor to do more climate and health protection. The kickoff event uh, is an action by people and health professions in front of the German Federal Parliament in Berlin on Friday, September 10th, and um, where hundreds of nurses, doctors, pharmacists, physiotherapists, and other health professionals move into their work closing from the Charité Hospital to the German Federal Parliament. And um, a big climate recipe is carried and handed over to the politicians there. And afterwards, there will be a press conference, conference in which uh, the connection between climate and health are to be clarified. And the question to, polit to politicians who will save 150,000 lives will be posed. In order to reach the people in Germany directly and to get more me medical, uh, no, more media attention uh, for our cause, visits um, of the Half of Future local groups will take place on the following week and in all major cities in Germany and other Half of Future cities. The vigils reflect the action in front of the German federal parliament in a local context. Climate receipts are distributed that we illustrate the connection between the climate crisis and uh, the health. So um, voters should be informed that the climate crisis is already threatening their health. The voters should take this into account in their vote and make the demand for climate protection to the future government. Health of Future will not position itself for or against the party. It is only indeed to clarify uh, the importance of the health protection. 
In addition to, uh, to the vigils, hundreds of practices and pharmacies in Germany take part in the action week by hanging um, up posters and uh, distributing uh, climate receipts. Uh, we are also currently working on a social media campaign to share all the action around the country. All of this uh, is organized and implemented by the individual local groups throughout uh, Germany. Shortly before the federal uh, election, it should be clarified that this election has to be a climate election because <laughs> healthy people uh, only exist on a healthy planet. Yes. Thank you. Um, there aren't any questions until now uh, in the chat. So I have a question. Can yeah. I join? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's really important that everyone who is listening, you can build up your own group now and have another city who joins in the vigils. You can come to Berlin to participate on the 10th of September. You can join the groups in all of the cities. You can inform yourself on the hands for future groups. It's a great example of how we are going viral in a positive sense. Yeah? And uh, it's going to be the late, this is a lot, by far the largest Health for Future campaign and action weeks that we have ever had. So don't miss to join in. It will be great to participate and it will be a great, great sign out there. And not only join for the 10th of September, but also for the cycling tour afterwards. For the, vi for the victuals, yes. And there's this question if we intend to do this Europe wise before the next European election. Um, Walter and Lena, you can say something to it, but I think it, why not? <laughs> why not? And the person asking the question is uh, welcome to join <laughs> the organization. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe we can left our email address so you can uh, write us if you have any questions left or if you want to join. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think actually everybody um, on this panel now here, like the six of us will be in Berlin then probably, so <laughs> yeah. And the week after in Munich, I will be, yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, so then uh, Leonie uh, will also uh, talk about something concerning the elections. Um, so we have another large Health for Future campaign in which we talk with politicians um, before the federal elections. Um, so what is all of this? What's, what's that about? Um, yeah, thank you very much, Hannah, for the introduction. Um, I'm Leonie, I'm a medical student in Berlin, and I'm part of Health for Future for a few years already, and I'm really happy to present this project to you today. Um, yeah, so actually a few months ago we were asking ourselves, like, how can we bring our demands more into politics and into policy making? Like, we, we believe the facts are somehow clear, but it didn't really reach the, like the urgency of this crisis, didn't really reach the, the general consciousness uh, already. Uh, so we were doing demonstrations and all kinds of events, but still it doesn't really seem to work. Um, so we thought about how to, how to do something else. And we decided to speak to our members of parliament, which are the decision makers. Um, so the background is that there's uh, 709 members of parliament uh, in Germany, only 30% women, by the way, um, and the German chancellor has been ruling for 16 years. So she was already there when there was Paris Agreement. Um, she's still there, but the measures taken are far from sufficient. So um, we, we thought, okay, we are more than 60 local groups of Health for Future, and there's more than 3,000 active members. So why don't we divide up these members of parliament and speak to them? And we wanted to show them our position paper um, to let them know that this crisis is a medical emergency. Um, and also to draw attention um, to the connection between climate and health, um, which wasn't really clear for all of them. 
Um, it was also about building a relationship to the decision makers. Um, and we also want to continue this in the next uh, period of government. Um, so yeah, how did we do it? We created a huge Excel sheet <laughs> with all the members of parliament inside, like sorted by their area. And then we connected the Health for Future local groups uh, to these areas. And uh, we did some kind of trainings, like how to speak to politicians, like what's our strategy, um, and try to motivate the whole movement to, to participate in this. Um, it's also interesting because you speak to the, to the politicians of your area, so it's somehow there's some kind of connection anyways. Um, yeah, so then um, the groups wrote emails and asked for appointments. And uh, yeah, just tried to get an appointment with the politicians. And today, as we're speaking, there's more than 40 of these conversations already held, and another 30 of the appointments are made, but um, another more than 100 appointments are asked for. So at least 200 of the members of our parliament heard about us at least and had to deal with us in some kind of way. And I think that's a huge success already, and we can further work on that. Um, so yeah, like how did it go? How, what did we learn so far? Um, for like what we talked about is that the reactions were mostly interested, like somehow positive. Um, and it was beneficial to be well prepared, like to have numbers and studies in the mind. But was, what was also really important was to have some kind of personal connection. Like for example, I spoke to a politician who was the president of my sports association also. So I told him I'm playing volleyball in your association. And he was like, oh, really? And then I told him, you know, me personally, I feel I can't be a good doctor if this climate crisis continues like this. And all these kind of personal um, conversation parts work really well. Like, like then you have a, like a level to speak with. Um, it was also good to be like around three people, like that one can be um, the moderation part, one can be like protocoling and stuff. So to share the task and to not be alone. Um, and yeah, it was also good to speak about co-benefits, like not only about this is all shit and you're doing shit and it's all gonna be horrible, but also to speak about like, how great is it gonna be if we turn this thing around? Um, and yeah, you, we also noticed that you need different strategies for different parties. Um, but yeah, some open questions um, is how to reach those that didn't want to speak to us. Like that's maybe the ones we need to speak to. Um, and also one big thing is that um, politicians always speak about consideration, like, you know, different parties have different interests and we need to combine them. And we were always like, but no, <laughs> like, uh, like we were thinking about how could we put more emphasis on this urgency of this uh, medical emergency that it's not about consideration anymore. That's really hard to focus on in these kind of conversations. Um, and yeah, so there's still a lot to learn, but uh, I really believe that we moved something in, in those people, like even if it's just a small, spark or just the seed you planted it's i i believe it it does something to them um so yeah we will continue and if you want to join us in germany or if you want to do something similar in in your country if you're not from here then uh, please feel free to write us i will put my email address in the chat and um yeah if you have any questions please ask and thank you very much for listening Yeah, another great project. Thanks, Leonie. Um, we'll continue with Maya. Maya Finkenstedt um, wrote together with others a manual um, or a guide explaining very practically how outpatient practices can become climate neutral. So we're moving away from politics to like the very practical side of, of medical um, of medicine. Um, so I'm curious to hear more from you, Maya. Thank you so much, Anna, for having me. I always love these uh, examples of transformative action stories. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so 
I'm a member of the Health for Future group of Hamburg. And um, last fall, we started writing this, we call it a handbook, and I called it a manual uh, for sustainable practices. Um, and I think we got the idea for that because we have a lot of uh, doctors from outpatient practices in our group in Hamburg. And I think it was the perfect way for them to participate and to do something on their own terms. Um, because most of the time they're working, um, they have to work in their practice when the demonstrations are and stuff like that. Um, and they, they could obviously contribute a lot to the manual because they had all the experiences. Um, yeah, so I think we, it took us about like half a year and uh, one shared document and several Zoom calls. And we finished in March. And since then, um, I would say, I wouldn't call them obstacles, but um, what proves kind of difficult was check the copyright of the pictures. If we want to publish it, where do we publish it? How would we distribute it? How do people get to know of this book? Um, but it, it, it was a really nice project and it doesn't prove like a lot of work. Um, it was really awesome for teamwork, I can say. <laughs> and uh, the feedback we got um, until now, because we only just like published it online um, and we started printing some physical versions. Um, we had to look for, for a sustainable um, company who pr prints uh, sustainable books. So that was um, some kind of work as well. But and now we're pretty happy with the results and the feedback we got um, was um, really nice. And I think um, a big part to that is due to it being the first kind of book or, or resource in the German speaking area. I have said the book, uh, unfortunately, is in German. Um, yeah, but if you're interested, I'll put the link in the in the chat. Um, uh, don't uh, don't worry. It's it's the link to the Health of Future Hamburg because that's where we put it. Yeah, and um, I think we will update the version, uh, make a second one, um, maybe later because there will be a lot more data published. I think there will be a lot of studies made in, for example, England. Um, because we are starting to decarbonize the health sector. So I think there's a lot of potential for this kind of, yeah, maybe literature <laughs> um, to develop and uh, further expand. Thank you. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you very much, Maya. And now Stephanie will talk. She's a medical doctor as well. and. That's another, uh, or she will present another approach to making your medical practice, or if it's not your own, the medical practice that you're going to if you feel ill or sick, and um, how to make it climate neutral by first calculating the carbon footprint. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my name is Stephanie Taché. I'm a family physician and I'm also a global health consultant in um, uh, health systems and uh, also part of the Global Health Hub Germany, which has a very good working group on health and climate change. So for those of you that don't know it, it's free of charge and you can join and uh, also contribute there. And today I wanna to, uh, describe, as Sylvia mentioned, a, a very practical tool for um, physicians with outpatient practices who want to calculate their uh, footprint, their CO2 footprint. So the first step to any kind of change or transformation is to realize um, where you where you are in in the process, and um, because five percent of um, Germany's CO two production stems from the healthcare system, uh, we are a group of physicians that wanted to know how can we also contribute uh, to achieving Germany's goal of having a climate neutral healthcare sector by 2035. And so one area is to decrease the CO2 footprint of outpatient practices. So we started um, an initiative called um, Initiative in Nachhaltige Praxis or the Sustainable Medical Practice Initiative in Dresden. This is a working group under the umbrella Health for Future Dresden, which is itself part of Klug. And um, we developed a checklist for sustainable medical practices. 
And we were contacted by um, another physician, Dr. Kolschmann, who is from the Foundation of Wilderness International to see if we would be willing to develop a CO2 calculator for outpatient practices. Uh, <clears throat> and so we went ahead and did this together. And this CO2 calculator is available on the web free of charge since May of 2021. And what this calculator does, it's a comprehensive and rather detailed calculator of the possible greenhouse gas emissions by outpatient practices um, with the most relative categories. So um, for those of you that don't have any experience calculating either your individual footprint or a CO2 footprint, there's different categories uh, that you have to go down to such as um, energy uh, with power or utilities, heating, water, disposable medical equipment, um, uh, practice infrastructure, paper and printing use. Uh, so it's a, it's a very long che checklist. And at the end, you um, get a little, sorry, I don't have slides, but it's basically you get a little pie chart of all the different aspects of your CO2 footprint. And <clears throat> Every time you input uh, data, you have a sidebar with recommendations on how you can decrease the CO2 footprint um, in your practice. For example, by changing from normal paper to recycled paper or from energy to renewable energy, um, or for example, very simple from using plastic cups to uh, glass cups. So it's not only a tool to calculate your CO2, but also gives recommendations of how you can decrease it. Uh, and then there's also the capacity to compensate for the CO2 um, through Wilderness International, which um, has projects in uh, Peru and Canada to they buy uh, rainforest. So, and th the data of this calculator is based as the previous uh, speaker said on NHS data because they're, they're more advanced in their kind of carbon emissions uh, calculation. That being said, there are some challenges with the, with the calculator. It's brand new. So there's only, um, there's some uh, practices that have done this, but um, there still needs to be more people doing it. And in it, um, the, the idea was to look at the entire practice, including patient mobility. So how do the patients come to a practice and also medications? What is the CO2 footprint of the medications? And I have to say, um, those are two huge chunks of CO2 at the end, which as physicians, we cannot control. So it's a little bit demoralizing. And for those of you that want to do this, I would recommend first do it without the medications and the, and the patient mobility because otherwise it's overwhelming. Um, so this, um, this tool is free of charge. I'm going to put the website of Wilderness International on the, um, in the chat for the user, of you that are interested. Um, and then if you have any further questions, um, I'm happy to, to answer them. In addition, for those of you that are um, in the dental field or the um, pharmacy, there are also um, for the dental, there's already a CO2 specific calculator for um, uh, dental practices, and there will be one coming soon for um, pharmacies. And lastly, so the first step is to realize, right, what, what is our CO2, but the second then will involve systems change, and particularly at the level of um, medical reimbursement and so there's a lot of policies involved but i think you know we in, as in all transformation we start with ourselves thank you stephanie i have one question yeah uh, you, you you pointed to that that around the, 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 the medical footprint and also the travel of the patient that's very difficult but actually my my hunch would be that it's actually good to see it from the beginning because uh, there are certain things we can influence and other things we cannot so easily influence, but it's yeah. really important to see the whole cake because uh, otherwise we could be preoccupied with improving the bit we can influence and not looking at the bigger picture. And, and I, I do think it's very important and, and also empowering to let, see what the game is and then jointly to see what are the things uh, that we can influence personally, but also the things that we have to join up to build coalitions to make yeah. policies. 
Because I think one of the great things, both from Maya's example and yours example, if you work towards that in your in your practice and you 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 share that with your patients, you are a model. Yeah. And then you start having conversations. And also for them, it's important to look at their personal footprint, but also then the other areas where they might want to share in kind of influencing policymakers, talking to, to parliamentarians and so on and so forth. So what, what, what is your sense? I, I, I agree with you 100%. I, and the, the only reason I say it is because we have had physicians that have started to do this and then they realize um, it's, it's quite difficult to, um, it's very detailed. So you have to do a survey at your practice to, to figure out what kind of transportation means are patients um, taking to come to the practice, right? Which means doing a questionnaire for a period of two weeks to one month. And some physicians are then just so overwhelmed okay. that um, the, the re only reason I said it is to make the barriere, you know, the, the Einstein, the like to limit the, yeah. um, to make it as easy as possible to at least do something. And then once, because also it can be that the physician at the practice level is very engaged, but the staff is not super uh, interested. Yeah. And so these transformations have to come um, step by step. And so, so you can do it in phases, but you can do it in phases, but I fully agree with you that it's only by looking and it's actually shocking when you see the amount the percentage of medications, uh, just medications that you say, well, it's as a physician, particularly as a general physician, you know, my main tool is prescribing medications. And yet I'm not having any, um, I cannot um, control how these are made. So then you have to get to the next level, which is activism to kind of change the system uh, because we can switch over, for example, inhaler, you know, inhalers uh, to, to the powder, but it's still limited. But I fully agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And um, because there had been one question that there's so many women, so this was not planned. This actually just happened. And we so far did no survey about how many, if there are more yeah, women or men, um, committed to the topic of planetary health, but yeah, probably an idea for a medical thesis if someone wants to do something. But now we have another presentation from Christian, who's also part of Klug, and unfortunately he can't join us today, so we will show a video from him. This is a short story about uh, transformative action um, in a book project. In 2020, I got to know the German Alliance Climate Change and Health. At that time, uh, we were already trying to initiate change in our hospital, a university hospital in, in Munich, with our climate change working group. At the end of the year, I decided to quit and to work for, for the NGO from then on. Right at the beginning, Martin Hermann invited me to create a reference book on climate change and health with three other ed editors. Normally, such a process takes uh, one and a half up to two, two years. The working title at this time was uh, Climate Change and Health. In our first meeting, uh, we distributed the talks and I agreed to write, among other things, uh, the part about uh, the ecosystems. The second meeting was to take place two weeks later. But meanwhile, while uh, writing the first draft, I understood that the book would also have a political message and the desire was formulated to also consider the health impacts from more large degraded ecosystems. At our second meeting, an important decision was made because if you wanted to consider other ecosystems, we had to change the title. Since then, the book has been called Planetary Health, Climate, Environment and Health in the Anthropocene. The second related to the time course. If it was to be a political book, it had to be published before the federal elections, which will take place in September this year. The publisher said, impossible. We asked him to calculate, we kindly asked him to calculate the timeline backwards from the Bundestag elections, assuming that it would be published at the end of August. The result was that the author would have only two months to research the implications for their respective fields. 
The editors felt that this should be feasible against all the rules, assuming that they were in a social tipping point, which would be helpful to convince uh, all the authors. Together with the publisher, we decided to go to go down this path. Now, five months later, after intensive work uh, among the editors and also with, a, with a, a variety of authors, we have received all the contributions from all the authors and all the editors, from A for anesthesia down to U for urology. And furthermore, we have additionally discussed other important aspects such as medical ethics, zero emission hospitals and divestment. Above all, we have established an important network that will allow us to make statements in the future about the clinical effects of damaged ecosystems for all relevant medical disciplines. And we hope that after the publication of our book, we will still manage to influence the political discourse before and after the federal elections. I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry that I had to pre-record the video and that I'm not personally available for questions but I, but I assume that Martin is there and can take over for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I want to add a few words because I'm one of the editors. And to be fair, actually, we had started before Christian was joining. So I was asking Christian to join us in January. And it was very clear from the beginning that he was the person driving the whole thing. So uh, when we had the discussion on the timeline, he was bringing in that it would be really a great symbol to have the first textbook probably on a global scale uh, out and in the public as a, as a symbol to the election. And so whenever we had discussion, he was very much the one person who was saying, let's drive this, this is possible. And I think it's a very important example because oftentimes when you talk about transformative action, we will have to deal with other people who say, yeah, it would be very good, but it really doesn't fit in. And we will need six months to prepare and then six months to kind of get it together. And then implementation perhaps can take place in two years. And many of us have started to say, why not try the impossible? Because the urgency is so big that we have to come to the point right away. And this was a surprise also for the publisher that when we asked the professors and the researchers for the different fields, that many of them were eager and willing to participate. And the publisher had never seen that before because from all his experience, normally people commit and then they're late and then it's very difficult. And then you have a delay of three, five, six months. And uh, we had a few delays, but then we're calling 